Did you record your calls last night? Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Justin Blake. Nice bright afternoon here in uh, in, in Dublin. The rain has cleared, and uh, we've got Rich uh, Dublin, uh, my colleague uh, from the states. Uh, how are you, Richard? I'm doing well. I'm in uh, upstate New York, and no, I'm not sitting on the Brooklyn Bridge like it oh. might look like I am. That's actually a picture behind me. It's it's not a virtual uh, screen. I I don't believe in those, but uh, <laughs> that's. That's yeah. We're in upstate New York. It's a bit chilly uh, today. Richie, uh, Rich, you are the editor and uh, the well, founder of the Lower Extremity Review. So a lot of podiatry colleagues and pediatric orthodist colleagues will be very familiar. Uh, but for say for Sir Carlos, osteopath, physical therapist, who may not know the Lower Extremity Review. I mean, I think I've been looking at it for maybe 15, 20 years, and used to get physical copies posted to Ireland. So tell us about the Lower Extremity Review. So, um, so I founded Lower Extremity Review in 2009. Uh, it serves podiatry, orthopedics, physical therapy, athletic trainers, orthotists, prosthetists, pedorthists. We serve 29,000 readers in print every single month. We are the only publication that crosses those disciplines. Uh, yeah. We do believe in collaborative care. Uh, we, we recently established the four pillars, if you will. Um, the four pillars are biomechanics matters, which is extremely important. A diabetic foot ulcers uh, can be prevented, which is obviously extremely important. Collaborative uh, care is um, for success and the multidisciplinary uh, need for treatment of the patient. Yeah. And what do you see of the main changes then over the last, you know, 15, 20 years then in, in, the, in the business, as it were? Um, well, I mean, there's a lot of change. I mean, there's a lot of innovation. Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, from the business side of things, you know, the days of, you know, running print ads and, and things of that nature, you know, a lot of things have moved digital. Um, there's a lot of opportunities now for content development uh, from a practice standpoint. I also have um, a, a, a division of the company called LER Expert, where we go into practices, uh, working with se several uh, podiatrists, in, in the New York and Connecticut area, as well as uh, some orthotists in the Midwest uh, on building practice. So building uh, content, positioning them as a key opinion leader, uh, yes. building their own publication for their own distribution, building hosting events through our, our other division called LER Expo, which we yes. launched prior to COVID. So there's just such a, a change in the dynamic of how you reach the market. Today. Well, I mean, well, this is a this is a recurring theme that we've had over a number of talks over the last year or so. Is that uh, you know a lot of clinicians aren't really prepared for that business world, but they're signed up on the way they go. I mean, it's 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 a it's, it's quite a competitive you know business, and it, I mean, there's no real training. No, well, there isn't. I mean, I just I just hosted an event uh, last night um, on podiatry and pedorthics uh, uh, through the PFA, and and I'm very um, in, in integrated into their strategy marketing and 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 development um for their organization or association and so we we host uh a well we're doing it monthly right now through ler expo but we're moving to quarterly events uh, more educational events Le not webinars i think the term webinar is overutilized i think the term webinar doesn't People don't even know what it is really, but they use the term uh, sort of like biomechanics, if you will. Right? Yeah. They just throw the term around like it's something they, they know what they're talking about. I hear, I see a lot of that um, in, in, in business, but we also this event and, and the, this particular podiatrist, we, he went into in private practice right outside, of, right out of residency. And he was frustrated and he lost a lot of money and made a lot of mistakes. And had there been some business classes or had there been a curriculum um attached to his his uh his his um degree me i mean i made very lots of mistakes and ran businesses very badly for about 10 or 15 years and in, in, in various guises and various practices and uh yeah i mean it, 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 it when, when you do change and actually start working on the business rather than trying to work on your your, your own your, your your yourself or buying equipment in for the practice to uh, I spoke to somebody this morning. They're thinking of getting a, you know, a fancy bit of kit in for thirty thousand uh, dollars. Not too sure what it's going to do to his patient bottom line, but maybe he might use it. You know, these things end up in very expensive uh, 
you know, clothes hangers in the corner of the clinics or the, you know, or, and, and things that when people don't have the, uh, you know, they think they buy a bit of a fancy bit of equipment, it, it will change their practice. But mm -hmm. a lot of times that never happens. No, it doesn't happen at all. And, and the thing that's frustrating, at least from my standpoint, when I speak with certain clinicians, I mean, think about the days when they first launched uh, foot scanners. No one really knew how to use it. So, you know, they have these fancy foot scanners and they'd be, they, they wouldn't be used. They'd still be casting and still be doing things the same way that they were. Uh, you know, there's a level of marketing that's required in a practice. And if you look at the successful practices, uh, you know, whether they be podiatry, orthopedics, or orthotist, prosthetist, whatever, whatever uh, type clinician, physical therapist, you know, it's the ones that are out there. It's the ones that are marketed. It's the ones that are networked. Um, again, skills that were not taught in school. So either, yeah. you know, I, I'm an entrepreneur by spirit, by, by nature, right? I, I've, I've done my own thing for as long as I can. Yes, I worked in corporate, but for the most part, I always had some things on the side that I was doing. Always knew I'd own my own publication. Uh, I had no idea it would be what it is today. And I would be in the industry I'm in today. But, you know, if you think about even the past year during the pandemic, right? Practices changed. It caught, put an immediate halt on what you were doing and how you were doing it. So mm -hmm. what was important was to look at, take stock of where you're at, work on your business, not in your business. Think about things that you could do differently, pivot, make changes, adjust. Mm -hmm. And some people don't have that ability. Some people get caught in the panic and the fear mode, and then yeah. they're mobilized. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's but important. Especially, especially at the start, it was... You know, I mean, the, the shutters down and everything stopped and nobody knew what was really going to happen. But certainly the proactive practices, and you know them, and the ones that I, I work with as well, you know, when you have regular in touch with the patients and you have all that sort of back office stuff to look after the patients, those practices came out of the first sort of lockdown, you know, busier than ever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But others struggled to make it that far. So, I mean, there, and there was that sort of mindset of... Uh, you know, it was a time to reevaluate. I know a lot of clinicians, yeah, did sort of, as you say, pivot. Yep. You know, do, do I want to be doing this in three or five years' time? You know, now is the time to get, now, now was the time, or then was the time, probably now is the time as well. <laughs> now, you know, we, we always keep changing. Yeah, oh, very, very much so. You know, I think I think that what, what's happened during the pandemic, and, and I think I really, it's been, it's been an amazing year for LER on a lot of different levels. Um, we're working with more clinicians uh, uh, globally than we ever have, uh, yeah. both on the editorial side um, as well as on the consulting side. And and you know we're doing we're hosting events. We've hosted with LER Expo uh, over a dozen events thus far. So, so tell us about the, the development of XPR Expo. So that's a, the conference side of lower extremity. Exactly. So so I had I've been going to trade shows for thirty years. Right. I've been to 400 plus trade shows in every specialty. And about seven years ago or so, I had this vision uh, for an expo, for an LER expo, an online exhibition, an online event. Um, I saw, you know, I, I was watching and listening to, you know, exhibitors complain, attendees complain. Um, you know, the conference organizers weren't happy. You know, attendance is down. Costs are up. I mean, it's 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 a lot to be at. Just let's say, just exhibit at an event. You know, on the low end, it's it's five figures. You know, um, depending on the size of your booth, how many people. That doesn't include lost productivity. I mean, there's so many different components that lended itself to building a virtual event. But no one, or at least they weren't. The industry wasn't ready. Let's just say that. So many people don't know this, but I started LER Expo. In Nobody the wanted to give up the jolly to Las Vegas, or or is it, did they? <laughs> Absolutely, 100%. And then write it off, right? Let's yeah. do that and write it off. Um, so um, I started LER Expo in, in October 2019 mm -hmm. with no knowledge of a pandemic, no idea that we would be in lockdown. I was uh, no, I was at a convention, at an O&P convention in Chicago in March. That was the last trade show that I've been to. Um, so we started in 2019. We were doing, you know, analysis, you know, assessment, needs assessment, design. We're, we're working on it. Branding. Fast forward to March, everything shut down. I go to my programmers. I say, where are we at? We were ready. Are we ready to launch? We're, this industry is ready for it. We haven't even written a line of code yet. So, you know, they were still, 
evaluating. I mean, we, we still had, I mean, I was going to a dozen trade shows every year. So I was planning on going, I was not planning on things being shut down. So then um, we, we, one of my programmers brought to my attention a certain platform. Uh, we were able to work together in a line and hence the launch of LER Expo. Our first event was in June. Yep. And, uh, and, and we're, we're now planning, you know, two dozen, 25 to 30 events this year. Um, you're organizing that for, for other groups then as well, as well as for your, for the, for the LER. Absolutely. Yeah. So the way that, so my original thought and original plan was, well, these associations have canceled events. So why not align with the different associations and put on their virtual events, their virtual conferences. And what I realized is like when doing that, what I realized is there's a segment of the market that's really sort of underserved in this virtual space. And it's the manufacturers, the manufacturers that buy a virtual exhibit, if you will, if that's what they call them. They're not, happy with the results. I, I talked to them all at numerous conferences. They're not. So what we started doing is we started hosting, building, hosting, marketing events on behalf of the manufacturer. So the manufacturer can now assemble clinicians, get credits and offer events, not webinars, not go to meetings, not Zoom events, but an actual event with interaction live, like we're doing now live for a, an audience that we drive traffic to. So because we have the publication, because we have, you know, 28,000 uh, on socials, because we have 180,000 visitors to our website, because yeah. we have the, the, the brand and, and the horsepower, we're able to build successful events for manufacturers. Mm -hmm. Can't go to a trade show for five to 10,000 bucks and walk away with 200 leads. It's not possible. It doesn't happen. But through LER Expo, we now provide that as an opportunity for the actual manufacturer to get that type of return on their investment. And the next big Podiatry Expo is coming up in another few weeks, is it? Yep. So, so we we are honored uh, to be working with um, not only the PFA, the Podorthic Footwear Association, and doing all of their virtual symposiums and virtual conferences, but we yep. also were able to work with the No Nonsense Seminar, um, the North Central Ohio. Uh, podiatry association they have a, they've had a brick and mortar event forever um i think 35 years and um i talked with dr hints uh, over a year ago right after they canceled their event in march and he just wanted to work with us and so we're facilitating we built we're facilitating we're marketing training we do everything uh for their event it's uh, 19 speakers uh 25 cme um and we're doing that event march 5th to 7th Yes. Uh, you can get the info on lerexpo.com um, under events. Mm -hmm. uh, you can register. The registration takes through their site. There's, uh, you know, um, as an APMA member, um, there's a certain fee. And as a non-APMA member, there's yeah. there's uh, another fee. But we're excited. I mean, there's going to be, uh, I mean, amazing speakers. It's an amazing lineup. Um, and, and so this is the future. I mean, let's let's call it what it is, right? I, I've met and dealt with more people over the past year than I have in my entire career. And it's been an amazing experience. So, you know, it's kind of where things are. Yeah, really, it's really, a, it, I mean, it's, you know, things were happening, but it, but it just really sped up the process, didn't it? It sure did. <laughs> it, it was like a shot in the arm, you know, uh, very much so. It, uh, it sped it up. But, you know, at the same time, you know, never shy away from challenges, right? No. When I launched, well, well, so I mean, well, but but a little bit of the history before the lower extremity review and a rewind back because you were involved in biomechanics publications initially. Yeah. So my career started uh, pretty much right out of college. Um, I, I I was taking some life seminars. Really was you know like any college student, not really sure what I wanted to do. Um, the seminar director's dad was a podiatrist. Uh, he had a, a magazine called Current Podiatry. It was a, a little clinical publication. And the dad passed away, unfortunately, and left the magazine to, um, his name was Doug, Doug Hanover. And Doug came up to me. I was 22 years, 23 years old, came up to me and he said, um, he said, Rich, you know, you got a good personality. You talk to people pretty well. Do you want to come sell some advertising for my podiatry magazine? So I'm 23 years old. I'm out of work, right? Taking life seminar, trying to figure out this whole thing. And I go, sure. What's a podiatrist? I had never heard the term, I, you know, 
And then fast forward 30, 35 years fast later. Or 30, yeah. 30 years later. Yeah. It's been a career. It's been an amazing uh, And so the biomechanics was, I mean, biomechanics said it. So at that stage, what, what's that, 25 years ago? I mean, biomechanics is huge then. Yes. Yeah. I mean, podiatrists were biomechanists. Yes, very much so. There was much more training. Uh, there was a lot of orthotics being done. Uh, we, so, so when I started with current podiatry, I was recruited by podiatry today. We did that for three years. And then we left, excuse me, left and started a magazine called Start Biomechanics, which was the first multidisciplinary lower extremity, extremity publication ever launched. Yeah. They were podiatrists saying you'll never get orthopedic surgeons and podiatrists to talk to each other. You'll never get physical therapists and orthotists to talk to each other. Podiatrists and podiatrists. No, 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 no. What was that? What's the, what's the secret of getting them to talk to each other? You know, I, I think what it comes down to is creating an environment that's collaborative. We're all in this for the same reason. All the clinicians are trying to improve outcomes for their patients. So, if, if a podiatrist has an experience in an area that can help a podiatrist, it's it, it's a valuable connection. That was the event we did last night, podiatry and podorthics. You know, utilizing their expertise, the podorthics expertise, to help the practice, the podiatry practice grow. Yeah. Physical therapy is working with, um, you know, with orthotist uh, patients from an orthotist. You know, after you have fit with a brace, you need physical therapy. So yeah. there's already this collaboration going on. But why are we all operating in silos when we should all be working together? It's sort yeah. of the same thing that's happened during the pandemic, right? Same exact philosophy. Yeah. No, there's always been, I mean, I, I've learned, you know, from, from a lot of great clinicians that I work with or, you know, we shared clinical space with it. You know, it's, it's, it's always good to collaborate with patients and, you know, you, you continue to learning uh, then and you get different views on, as you say, how you would treat things. And, mm -hmm. and then over the years we'd worked with, in clinics that we had and, and developed, we would have physical and rehab therapists involved in the patient treatment, anatomy and motion practitioners. Again, it's getting in the the, the best people to, uh, to 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 help with the patients better, rather than you trying to do it all. Because I think you're of the opinion the podiatrists themselves should be, you know, shouldn't be casting or shouldn't be doing that sort of rehab stuff themselves, uh, because they're better serves and, and better value from seeing the patients directly. Well. There's, I, I think that's partly true. Yes, I think I think when you think about building a, a team or a successful business, you think about at least it's my philosophy, right? I build, I have a magazine. I publish a magazine every month. We have all these other products. I don't try to be a graphic designer. I don't try to uh, develop email blasts. I don't try to write articles, edit yeah. articles, assign articles. You have people that are experts in what they do. It's not possible to be an expert in everything, right? If you're, if, if, if you're like, I think for me personally, I'm strategic, I'm creative, I think bigger, I look, at, I look at the big picture, and then I piece the pieces together with the people that are good at what they do to build a successful product. I think that's the, that's the key to a successful business. For years, I wasn't a good delegator. I didn't know how to delegate. I wanted to do everything. But yeah. you, you'll spin it. I was similar, and also especially in, in practices as well, uh, when you're starting off, you know, you might try and dabble in a bit of Google AdWords or a bit of Facebook or a your newspaper or, or or a bit of on on doing your own graphic design for the poster in the clinic. But but of course, when, once you want, and a lot of people do that because they think they're saving time and money, but but the, but they're not. And again, it, this has been a repeating theme that well, with one of my ex mentors was uh, you, know, uh, you know successful people spend money to save time. That's right. So hire a graphic designer from Upwork. I mean, I'm talking to guys now about doing some, uh, as you say, some emailing. Yes. Uh, and some content create or some copywriting. You know, I'm not very good words wordsmith. You know, these people can. This is their job. So that's you right. hire the guys in. I mean, that's the way to go, isn't it? Hundred, hundred percent. One hundred percent. Focus on what you do. Be an expert at what you do. Be the best at you. Best that you can be at what you do. And find people that are the same at what they do for the category that you need. Um, and you use a great use, of, you know, you put out Upwork. I mean, I, I'm literally working on another project and I just had today sent a voiceover for, for a video that we're, that we're doing uh, through uh, uh, some connections that I have on, on Upwork. There, there's, there's so many tools out there. The key is building the relationship with 
with someone that you trust, yes. that, right? The someone that you uh, it has your best interest at heart. And I think you know, thirty years in, when it comes to lower extremity marketing or publishing or content development or website design or branding, you know, we bring certain element of trust to that community because mm -hmm. we've been doing it for so long. Yeah. And so I think that's the important thing. What, no matter who you work with, just making sure that the people that you are working with, you know, have your best interests at heart. Yeah. I think that's really everybody's willing. And so the, 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 the biomechanics uh, slant, beat, but as it, we'll touch back on on the or, or orthotists, or the beat orthotists, uh, I mean, biomechanics is huge. And everybody was casting, orthotics were the big thing for, but, 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 you know, it was before PRP came into clinics and before, yeah. before scanners and injections and, and, and steroids and things. Orthotics were the, were, were, were the treatment, especially yeah, with the running in the 80s and 90s. Absolutely. Um, you know, you I mean, I, and then and then, you know, then the reimbursement issues hit. Right. So, you know, I, I think yeah, that's this the common theme. I mean, it is. There, I mean. You obviously work with, with with clinicians who want to, and I was talking to somebody last week who wants to pivot away from the uh, more to a cash pay practice. Very much so. Boutique practices are in. Yeah. You know, I think you know p patients are more educated. There's more information out there on on the internet, uh, credible information. I mean, we we're 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 at a hundred, almost one hundred eighty thousand unique visitors a month to our site, right? Yeah. We have over five thousand pages of evidence based content. So they're coming in from all different, all different uh, searches. And, and the other side of this part of the puzzle that a lot of people don't think about is search engine optimization, you know, SEO. You know, people use that term SEO, SEO, SEO. Well, you know, we've developed a segment of our business where we're providing SEO for our consulting clients mm -hmm. and, and building their traffic to their site, building their search terms and yeah. growing that market because that's what consumers are doing. They're searching on the internet, looking for things, and you want your practice to come up above somebody else. But, um, you know, you, you go to orthotics. You know, there was, you know, the U.S. is very uh, uh, driven by reimbursement, right? If I buy a product for five, I want to sell for 100. And, and unfortunately, you know, I think the mentality sometimes is, is, is off, I think sometimes we're not always picking the best product for our patient. We're picking the most profitable product. And that's I, mean, I was in a clinic today and the guy's like, I've just changed orthotics labs. Uh, I'm getting these for a hundred. What do you think of them? Uh, it looks like an orthotic, but the other, you know, he's just, he's, they saving himself 50, 60 uh, bucks, a, a pair of orthotics. That's right. Will it be good in the long term? I don't know. It'll, ha it'll we'll, we'll have to see. So. Well, you bring up a great point, you know, the orthotic space. I mean, you have you have companies charging 150 for the device to the clinician, and you have some that are charging 50. It's not possible. It is under 50. It is not possible to make a true custom orthotic for $50. It is impossible. There's no they're, they're a library. They're a library based on a library system. Exactly. So you need to ask questions as a clinician. They need to ask questions of their lab to find out what is really going on behind the scenes, right? What is really happening behind the scenes? Um, it's it's critical to understand, are you being a charge for a custom but not being uh, supplied a custom? Yeah. Um, you know, what- I think in the worst one I had, I don't know whether you picked up last year, we mentioned this. Uh, a, I had a lady who came with posterior tibial dysfunction. So she's been to see another therapist in another clinic and was waiting for her orthotics. But came to see me in the meantime and it was we started treatment some rehab and manual therapy and it was the orthotics were coming next week and next week anyway six weeks later she turned in with the orthotics had come and this guy had cast her and sent it from ireland to the states to get anyway she took them out of the thing he had given her a pair of vasili dannenberg off oh. the shelf which you can buy retail for 40 but oh just over 40 bucks mm -hmm. uh I can't remember, was it 600 or 800 euros he charged her? Wow. Yeah, I mean, that's horrible. That's horrible. And, and I, don't, I think that's more the anomaly. I don't think that's yeah. more common. Um, for this patient had been built up and it was going to be custom and it was going to be the best thing and these were better than stuff. And I mean, I was looking forward to seeing them as well. And I mean, you know, I mean, if what happened to ethics? 
where are the ethics, right? Uh, you know, where where are our morals? Where where are our values? How how are we standing behind something like that and knowing we're just taking advantage? I think mm -hmm. that's just horrible. Yeah, but I mean, as you say, that's not the, that's not the uh, that's not the norm. Although some clinic clinicians were sort of this, <laughs> dispensing orthotics like Smarties for everything. Mm -hmm. They are, and and I think I think um, you know, you know, it's kind of like uh, therapy. Let's say, right? I think everyone could use a little bit of therapy in their life. So, can everyone use a pair of orthotics? Hmm. And, you know, I mean, uh, you know, a pair of, of, of insoles, I, I think most people can benefit from a pair of prefabs. I mm -hmm. believe that. I mean, I don't think we're all, um, you know, well aligned, biomechanically correct, functioning at our high level. So um, I think, you know, a pair of prefabs is, 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 a, is a positive. I think when you, when you think about custom, that's but, different. Yeah. But so do you think there be, that's been a little bit of a push away from biomechanics because it was a little bit, I always talk about fingers crossed that those people will come back in two weeks and the orthotics will have made a difference. I mean, do you think that's why it was because there is the art science section of it? You know, two patients presenting the same problem. One comes back, loves them. The second one comes back, hates them, throws them mm. through. Your window. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, I think that's maybe why biomechanics wasn't sort of seen as, or, you know, there's more a slant towards uh, surgery, which is obviously a fixed outcome. Mm hmm. Well, I do think that. I think that uh, podiatrists want to fancy themselves surgeons. I think that's something that is true. That's an undercurrent. I think when it comes to uh, biomechanics, I think you've got to think about biomechanics pre and post surgery. And I mm -hmm. think there is is a need for understanding on how the foot's functioning prior to surgery and how the foot's going to function after surgery and what you're going to do post surgically if you're going to have a device or an orthotic. Listen, I'm not a clinician. I'm only going on. You know, this is sort of. Yeah, but you, you've, you've learned and, and or spoken to enough practitioners that you know you need to understand the fundamental biomechanics to choose the best surgical option for that type of patient. A hundred percent, be the best outcome. Uh, so uh, one of the things that I want to touch on that I think is 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 critical when it comes to you know therapy, orthotic therapy, is you know, and you said this, you know, the, the, the orthotics end up in the closet or, you know, they don't end up tolerating them. They can't wear them. They're not working. How is it that we in this orthotic space, okay, are still doing or with, with all the advancements in technology and all the innovation in medical care and all the, the new exciting developments, how is it that we still make orthotics the same way that we made them 60 years ago. How is that even possible with all the advancements? It doesn't make any sense. 2% of the people are doing 3D printing. Or 2%, well, 20, they're, not making, they're not making my glasses in the same way they were 60 years ago? Exactly. I, I'm, but what, right? I mean, do you, there, there's so many advancements, there's so many changes that have taken place. And, and I think it's important to consider some of this additional, some of this technology, you know, the reproducibility component. You know the the um, uh, the if increased productivity, the efficiency, and and I'm not just talking 3D printing, but I'm talking about just technology in general. Technology, well, but it's moved on. I mean, I think Simon Bartold mentioned that we must touch base with him again. He, he he expects in two or three years' time, you walk into any sort of high street sneaker store, shoe shop, and you'll you'll get scanned. You'll go for your coffee, and you'll come back, and it'll have printed it, and the, the, and the orthotic will be combined into the shoe. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be the way. And I mean. It, Somebody mentioned a few weeks ago. We talked, said it was quite a long time to print. I saw something on a, on a, on LinkedIn the other day. It was a, a printed orthotic in an hour. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's not that long. I mean, this is. But this is the problem. It's like you know, we 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 tend to hear something, and then we we take that as gospel. Like this is what it is. We we you know, it's important for us to learn. It's all fake news, right? It's all fake news until you go and you learn the news until you go and you seek out the news and the information for yourself. Because what, what, what we hear is not always true mm -hmm. in anything, whether it's, you know, yeah. this conversation, I mean, we're only here, we're only talking about our own experience, our yeah. own, you know, your experience, mine. But in reality, if you want to learn, you got to go out and learn it for yourself. You got to yeah. seek the information out and then make the decision on what works best for you. Yeah. And because you were saying that some of those, uh, Put podiatrist on the call last night. I mean, uh, with a full 
podiatric training, the guy had cast only or made two pairs of orthotics in his undergraduate training. Yeah, that's exactly right. Came out, and the other, and the only extra pair he made, made one, but the oh. only the additional pair was made because he took an extra month training yeah. in biomechanics. He took an extra biomechanics training it for a month, and now yeah. he didn't do any orthotics. He yeah, I have guys who've come to come to me for jobs, and after a three or four year training course, one guy had never cast a patient. What? <laughs> yeah. What? Well, Never it, passed. Missed that day. Missed it. He told yeah. Him, yeah. yeah. He's going to turn up and want to start private practice. That's exactly right. He wants to go to skeletal practice in Dublin now, but he never cast a patient. Cast a patient. Exactly. But well, what about also the other side of it that I think is is important? And I think I think all the insurance companies are going to move towards this, and that is documentation, right? Documenting success and and of the outcome. So if you if 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 you're fitting a patient with an orthotic, have them walk on a mat, have them you know look at their gait, put the orthotic in, and then see what the results are. Does it offload? Yeah. What does it do? What you say it's going to do? If it doesn't do what you say it's going to do, then clearly it's not the right product. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's it's the re a lot of the, a lot of it is because of the reimbursements on orthotics through the insurance companies. So yeah. They don't reimburse yet. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think he's gonna, they're going to require, I think they're going to require um, outcomes measures. I think they're going to require some data. I think they're going to, you're going to have to quantify the results of what it is that you're doing and the service you're providing, especially around biomechanics or bracing. A hundred percent. That's what's, that's where it's moving. I mean, there are companies out there that provide obviously technology for you to measure um, and quantify the success of your, of your treatment uh, protocol. Yeah. Um, and I think it's going to be important to do that. I think that's, you know, if you're a clinician, you want to present a certain image and a certain um, experience for your patient, you know, that adds to the credibility of what it is that you're saying, because you can document the success of it. Then anybody looking at the screen can see, oh, the treatment, it was, I, look, I walked like this before, I put an orthotic in, and now I walk like this after. Wow, that's amazing. I can see the, the 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 success right there. So 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 Glenn Foley says surely that should be being done already. But I think it was that that's probably I mean that those outcomes are judged on surgery and different things all, already. Uh, but you're saying they're going to start to apply to the. Uh, to, uh, I agree with what was just said. It should be done already, but it is not being done. If you survey a hundred podiatrists, I will promise you that more than 90% of them are not doing that. Mm -hmm. They, they cast the patient or have somebody in their office cast the patient either with a phone box or a scan or a plaster cast or a slipper sock or whatever the case may be. They send it to the lab. They don't know exactly what they're getting back. They get back what they pr supposedly prescribe, but there's so much human error in between the casting and the, and the end result. I mean, listen, we can watch videos on making foot orthotics in a lab. I've toured 30, 40 labs over my career. You know, there's a lot of room for human error. The, the funny one was, remember the direct mill casts? Yeah. You're familiar with those. Yes. So, you know, you see you cast and you measure and the thing and then make them and they grind them out. Then they take, take them all after they've ground them out. Yeah. And then they throw them in a big uh, tumbler with a load of pumice. Yeah. That's right. Oh, the orthotics for ours to get the rough edges off them. You yeah. go, you're just taking this <laughs> structured, you know, finely engineered product and throwing it in with a load of stones. Exactly. And then put that under a patient's foot and hope right to. Yeah. So and what they're doing they're crafting their, their, their prescriptions for the patient and they don't know how the orthotic was made. Absolutely. And I think it's critical to understand that side of it. And, um, yeah, uh, believe me. We like, were right. <laughs> I've been I mean, in this any way out from the. I mean, you know, the insurance companies because the, the, well, this is my my friend Christopher in Spain. Hi, Christopher, if you're watching. He was the other day. Well, why would people, if they have a health insurance in the states and there's a cash pay option, why would they take the cash pay option? And I was like, well, because the deductibles are so high. Mm -hmm. thought, well, why would you bother having health insurance if you could afford to pay cash? For catastrophic, right? I mean, yeah. you know, if something catastrophic happens, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, I have my hip replaced. I was good to health health insurance for that, but I certainly wouldn't want a you know major sort of a you know 
rather than on elective sort of surgeries or all long ongoing treatment. So yeah, surgery, surgery or treatment is going to run into the millions is why you have insurance. Yeah, absolutely. For those catastrophic, unfortunate catastrophic situations. And do you think for that, they're sort of taking advantage? I mean, they're actively sort of trying to remove it. Well, the ones that I am working with are, is there a big push to get out, get away from insurance companies? Um, I think they'd like to. I think they're afraid. I think podiatrists and other specialties are afraid of what could happen to their bottom line if they don't take insurance anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, I've gone into practices and, you know, you, a lot of practices don't even, it won't collect a copay. You know, you, you, you hopefully you want to collect a copay and sometimes it, you, you just, you know, is there, you, they don't pay or credit or check or things bounce. And then you're scrambling to get $30 or $25. You know, it's, it, it's a challenge. Whereas if you set your practice up where, you know, you differentiated yourself, I mean, this goes back to what we talked earlier about marketing and it's creating a differentiation. And this is true for any business. I mean, we're just talking about podiatry or, or any other clinician for that matter. You have to differentiate yourself. And if you can do that successfully through personality, through marketing, through branding, through content, through, you know, becoming that key opinion leader, being out there in, 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 in the community, lecturing you know, presenting, you're going to command a different patient. You're going to command a different, you're not going to command somebody walking in here that, you know, wants to, um, you know, get the cheapest, the cheapest service, if you will. You know, they'll be willing to pay and you'll be able to document and prove that this is working. Yeah. It's not just, oh yeah, well, I'll give you an orthotic. And in the case of yours, you know, I'll get a facility and sell it to you for 800 euro. And, you know, you, you know, hopefully won't know the difference. I mean, that's not a, that's not what we're talking about here, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, and you know. The, uh, well, well, that's it across all the practices. But, of course, you know, it's easier now to get in front of an awful lot more people, as you say, as, as with the online uh, uh, course you have last night and the, and the, and the exhibitions. I mean, you can be in front of so many hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, I mean, I've seen a couple of couple of podiatrist contributors on TikTok of just, kicked over the million followers. Yes, absolutely. Promoting for battery around the world, you know, probably more than any society or anybody has ever done, or, or any, any, I'd say any of the societies or, or any of the organizations or the registration boards have ever done. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's, it, it, you know, so it's, it, it's a great time and now, and especially with, with, with everybody getting fitter and healthier and wanting to, to stay in peak condition. I mean, with, treating musculoskeletal problems it's the bread and butter i mean this is where we are now this is the wheelhouse we should be in and yeah. it's a golden time so there should be no reason why we shouldn't be you know busy busy or more busy all the time I agree. listen podiatry i mean i've been in it for 30 years right i've been in the space for 30 years and you know the feet are the foundation of your total health and well-being i truly believe that but i don't think that that's communicated enough out in the world. I'm not, and, and, and I'm not talking about, you know, just to your little segment of patients or just to the clinician segment. I'm talking about overall that message, right? I think if someone hurts their knee, they don't think that the knee is related to the foot. They immediately yeah. think about their knee or their hip. You know, I know for a fact and have experiences personally that if, if, if you're fixing your foot, you're going to fix your entire body. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're out of balance or your gait is off, um, there and, and you're able to control that through movement, not through immobilization, but through yeah. movement, because that's the other piece I believe. We did a we did an orthotics article uh, several years ago. If anybody hasn't seen, I mean, if anybody watching hasn't seen or seen the lower extremity review, I mean, I've been looking at it for years. Yeah, I mean, there's so much great content in it. Uh, a lot of biomechanics, a lot of sort of research. I mean, it sort of picks the best from from right across the all all the different uh, services. Yeah, uh, and, yeah, and I mean, it was it was where I used to sort of sit and read biomechanic stuff that was that was coming coming out. But it's also then you that was the C. I mean, if it was the first first time I sort of seen heard of PRP was in the lower extremity review yeah. because you know before it even sort of research before it even made here mm -hmm. made it these shores. Uh, then there were clinics in Dublin a few years back. If you sat still in the waiting room long enough, they were sticking PRP into you. <laughs> I mean, I think they've sort of backed off a little bit from that now. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen a lot of that in the literature as as of late. Um, 
you is know, there? I mean, is there something else that's going to sort of come into vogue at the moment? I mean, I touched with Peter Wishty on the more of the biologics and the, and I mean, I need to get on to sort of that the whole sort of stem cell type of regenerative, regenerative medicine. Regenerative medicine, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's definitely you know been in in the literature, been been talked about a lot. Yeah. Um, you're going to see. A, I I think personally, I think there's uh, going to be a lot more on 3D printing. Uh, there's a lot more developments we've done. Uh, you know, we did whether it be on the orthotic and prosthetic side, um, or whether it be on the orthotic side, foot orthotics. I think there's going to be a big movement um, in that regard. Yeah. I think that consumers are 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 demanding things quicker, faster, more reliable, more consistent. Um, so I think there's going to be some some movement there uh, to come in 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 the coming uh, come in you know for this year. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you never know. Uh, a lot of things that come kind of, you don't know what's being researched until it's actually out. And then when it's out, then, you know, we plug into it and bring it to our readers so they could keep abreast of, of what's being, um, of what's being published. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. We have such a tremendous editorial advisory board. We have a great group of clinicians that are very, just an integral part. My editor is, is phenomenal. Her name is Janice Raddick. She's up in Cleveland. Um, you know, we're all about collaboration. You know, we work with various associations. Um, you know, every you know we work with ACFOM, which is not ACFOM anymore, but you know, it's it's the the conservative side of of, of podiatry. You know, um, to contribute content, we work with uh, the NATA to contribute content. The Athletic Trainers Association, you know, money association want to work with us because we hit more than what they're their publication hits, their associate association publication. Yeah. Many manufacturers want to work with us because we bring such a broad breadth of not only coverage, but readership. So if you have an orthotic product, or you have a bracing product, or you have a, a shoe, there's not a better place to position it mm -hmm. outside of LER because no one hits the markets we hit. Because you've got a broad, broad church, as it were. I'm just, exactly. just something that popped into mind. Is it, where is it going to word this? Do you think there was maybe a little bit of then the, a lot of the professions were sort of weren't working as well together because obviously they were competing for the insurance sort of dollar through the through the through the systems? I think I think it becomes I think, you know, I've heard these I've had many of these conversations over the years, uh, you know, podiatry specifically, you know, what I've heard terms um, again, this is just conversation I've had with other clinicians. If uh, if you refer a patient to a podiatrist, you'll never get the patient back. Okay. Well, then you won't get the reciprocal referral. I don't believe that to be true. Um, but these are just thoughts. Chiropractor, the same kind of thing. Once you refer to chiropractor, you never get the patient back. You know, whereas I think that there's a place for everyone, right? You think about somebody comes in with diabetes, right? They go to their primary, they get their endocrinologist, they get referred maybe to a podiatrist. The podiatrist might need a product. They refer to an orthotist to build a brace. Then the patient might need uh, some some um, physical therapy, you know, so it, they're already referring between each other. We can't do everything for the patient. We, we as podiatrists or not we, but podiatry or orthotists or physical therapists, you can't do everything. Mm -hmm. It's like we said earlier, it's not possible. So work with the other clinicians in your community that can help deliver the best result for your patient. Mm -hmm. Network, network, network. And yeah. you, if your patient needs footwear, talk to a podorthist, right? Mm -hmm. If you're, if, if your um, patient needs a, a, an AFO, refer to the orthotist because what's going to happen is they see patients that need pod podiatric care. They see patients that need physical therapy. So if there's this, there's this back and forth, that's collaborative care. That's if you see it from somewhere from abundance where it's actually going to benefit the patient, so it's going to benefit your practice. Exactly. Rather than if you're looking at a, at, a, at, a, at a from a scarcity mentality where it's, I'm not going to give this guy away. I've only just got him. Yep. Why would I refer him? Yeah. Because it's, you know, it's the best. It's going to be the best. You know, I've often never even probably shouldn't say this. You know, at some stage, you know, within 10 minutes, it's like, sorry, you're not in the right place. You know, I don't know how you would get through the, because we had a quite a, you know, it wasn't just phone up and make an appointment and come in this afternoon. We had a, bit of a system to get make sure you saw the right patient 
I would be honest with them. I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not going to take your money. This isn't the right place for you. This is the guy you need to go and see. And that brings in so many, so much more referrals than anything else. Listen, almost with trust. That's the, where the trust comes back in again. You mentioned at the start. Absolutely. I, I think it's about the short view versus the long view. Yeah. Do we take a long view or are we looking at just the short view? You said it, scarcity mentality. Are we worried? Are we fearful? Or are we open and receptive and collaborative? And I think when you when you when we look in the mirror, it is important, at least the way I think, to think about where can we connect with others? Where can we collaborate? Where are the opportunities? The opportunities are not where we our minds can only get us where it's gotten us thus far. We need input from others to grow. We need to be open-minded to experience new things. We cannot feel like we have the answers to everything. Yeah. It, it's, it's like, to me, when I, when I think about my business, when I think about, um, thanks, Navid. When I think Navid, about- I have to talk to Navid. Navid works for Adidas. In, uh, he's a footwear designer in, uh, for Adidas in Germany. And uh, so oh. hi, Navid. We're going to have to get Navid on. He'll be able to tell us what is happening in, uh, in footwear design. Absolutely. Uh, We'd love to. We'd love to talk to you. Maybe there's a opportunity to participate in LER, or you know, participate in an expo, or connect with some of some of the people that we know. And, and to me, yeah. like you know, I read a long time ago um, uh, the Malcolm Gladwell book, uh, The Tipping Point. Yeah. I don't know if you ever read it or, or heard yeah. about it, whatever. you know, he talks about connectors, right? There's people that are genuinely connectors. They bring people together. They look to collaborate. They look for opportunities. There's so much more to be achieved in, in a whole than as an individual. You know, there's yeah. so much more. And, and to me, I find these exchanges, uh, every exchange I have is something I learned something new. I, the, the new the, I, I said this recently at, at, at an event that I, that, I, um, that I spoke at. The two words that are killers are I know. As soon as you say I know, the conversation's over, Right? Because we don't know what we don't know. We have no idea what opportunities, capabilities, uh, uh, perspectives, what, what's out there. The only way I learn is from listening to other people. Mm -hmm. And so if we can continue to learn and grow, who knows where things will be five years from now, 10 years from now. We have, to have goals and we have to set goals, but we still have to do the things to get there. And so if the, if the way that the training continues to go and the more push towards a surgery residency, which is what, what the podiatrists are going to go to, uh, are podiatrists going to be, you know, taken over or, or usurped uh, by other professions on the biomechanics side of things? I think it's happened in certain areas. I think, you know, um, when it comes to sports medicine or it comes to, you know, athletic trainers or it comes to physical therapists. Um, because everybody's providing orthotics and insoles now i mean from the local pharmacy shop sports sports shop stand on the map and push the button or yeah. whatever system they have just even off the shelf in the in the pharmacy there, there's so many options for patients now exactly and they the thing is you know they they're they're not inexpensive either i mean and this is this is even not looking at where you can like you, you know the lens crafter mentality for the 3d printed orthotics you, you might be able to, as you said earlier, and as, or as Simon said, right? And I know Simon, he's awesome. Um, you know, we've worked together in the past. You know, you're going to walk into a shoe store. You're going to be able to get a pair of orthotics. Why, why? Now, there will be an opportunity, right? There will be an opportunity for those cases where not everybody just can get a simple, you know, device. You're going to need to see a clinician. And there'll have to be a relationship rather than this competitive Nature, yeah. you're taking my patients, you're selling orthotics at retail and all of that mentality. How about, listen, I'm an expert in this area. I treat the foot and ankle. I'm an expert. If there's cases and situations with your customers where they might need something a little bit better, more, a little more attention, maybe they need care of a clinician, we're here, right? I mean, look, look. I, mean, I had that when I worked in a sports cent in, 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 in central London. And it was in within a retail environment, ski retail and ski boot fitting. But I mean, the guys were who could fit a boot or fit an orthotic at a certain level. Mm -hmm. But if somebody had a complicated 
job. I got to deal with it. The guy who's fallen off the mountain and his ankle didn't flex and his pins here and those sort of things. I mean, you know, those guys, that was it. So they were on the retail floor with a bit of basic, basic training on how to fit ski boots and things. Mm -hmm. uh, and the company was very good, regularly updating them. But when, when it was outside their level, I got to see it, yeah. which was a great way to work. You know, listen, it's it, patients are going to seek out their own treatment. They're going to say, I could buy an orthotic at, at, at retail, custom 3D printed for 190 bucks or 200 bucks or 150 bucks or whatever it's going to be. Or I'm going to go to my podiatrist. Because it's like that lady who got overcharged for the orthotics. He had cast her and had, would like, well, I'll phone you when they come in. So she had seen me for treatment as well as going to see him. So, yeah, that's it. People think their patients are, you know, if they're not getting, they won't tell you when they leave the clinic that, well, actually, that's not what I wanted. So they go off and get something else and still see you as well. It, it, absolutely. They will. Pete, we are, the consumer today is much more educated. Much, much more. Well, I was speaking to my lawyer this morning, all the stories this morning. I was in town this morning, the first time in a while. My lawyer uh, had some sciatica pain, but went off to uh, see a colleague and got some uh, temporary orthoses, orthoses. But he realized after two days he had hurt his shoulder before lifting something. So he's already taken the proxim for it. So he, think it was, mm -hmm. he thinks it was the anti-inflammatories for the sciatica, Rob, for, for the shoulder pain. Rather than the orthotics sure. to fix it. It took them two or three days to figure that out. So there's yeah. all these different things. There's, there's all these different things. And it's also the psychosocial. It's, it's, it's like in another talk is, you know, if you get your orthotics today and everything, you have a great week and everybody goes well, your team wins at the weekend and, you know, whoever, whoever you like gets voted in as president, you have a great week. If you leave the thing and you crash the car on the way home, the dog dies and the thing, I mean, you're going to have a completely different outcome the next week. Of how were the, how were those orthotics? Mm -hmm. Brilliant compared to, you know. So there's so much psychosocial involvement in it as well. Very, very true. Very true. You know, um, you know the placebo effect, right? Is there a placebo effect? Yeah. Do we well, know? You know, there's uh, a lot of research. The patient gets better when they come in and they've got them in the wrong shoes. <laughs> exactly. I oh my gosh, I was in so funny. I was in um I was in the pharmacy uh. Uh, a couple of days ago, I'm in Walgreens, uh, just picking up a few things, and I, I and I'm standing there, I'm waiting in line. And I heard a mother say, "Oh, you know, to her son uh, who's wearing a Taekwondo outfit, and he had just come from Taekwondo around the corner." And uh, she says, "Oh, she goes, are your feet hurting?" So you know, I immediately turn around. You know, anybody talks feet, my head turns right, and, and I look down. And the kid's got the shoes on the wrong feet, <laughs> and he goes, "No, they feel great." She said, "Mother, no, they feel great." Take them off and put them on the right way around. <laughs> yeah, think. Uh, it just yeah. Made me, it just kind of made me think. It's just funny. Um, it's just funny. yeah. Well, that's it. I mean, patients. I mean, you think that's part of. I mean, also you 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 know that the, there's the, uh, the the serial the the patient with the bag of orthotics and six pairs of ten pairs who's coming to see you. I mean, sometimes you just don't need to. Uh, they don't need just another pair of orthotics. But a lot of times that is because, I mean, psychologically, it's like, why didn't you go and see the part, the last person? Mm -hmm. A lot of times that's because they made the decision and spent that time and effort and money to see that person and didn't get that result. So they feel embarrassed themselves mm -hmm. to go back and ask the podiatrist. Yeah, very or, true. Or, or other clinician. And, and, also, and also then, you, you know, they may, you may never see them again. And you say then they just go off and you could have planned this all out. That sounds fantastic. But they leave, and it's like that's not really what I wanted. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, you gotta, you have to listen. How about follow up? Right? How hmm. about follow up? Do do you, as a clinician, when you fit a patient with a pair of orthotics, do you follow up with them in 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 three, four weeks, two yeah. weeks, see how they're tolerating the device, see if it's working, see if you need well, adjustment? Same way, same way, I would hope that they're going to be phoning them up after a surgery or after an injection to see how they've tolerated if there's been any adverse reactions. I mean, those sort of those sort of simple things to do in the car on the way home at the end of the day uh, make a huge difference to the end of the business. I mean, everybody goes on about SEO and marketing, advertising. A lot of the simple things, are the small tweaks, the, the small things that you do day to day in the practice, which which gives you that, builds that sort of momentum and they and I'm able to grow the practice. Mm -hmm. A lot of those things don't even cost any money. No. Don't take any time, but it's just a habit of not doing them. Yeah. 
It's, I think it's truly about customer service. I think at the end of the day, it's how you treat people. Do you treat people kind, generous, supportive, understanding, loving? Are you genuinely care about the people that you're working with? Whether it's me selling advertising, building programs, doing an expo, whether it's you and I on this conversation, whether it's you with your guests, what, whether you're in practice seeing patients all day long, yes, you have a busy practice, yes, you might be seeing a lot of patients, but do you take the care and concern with every single person you deal with? How do you treat the person in the grocery store that you're in line with? How do you treat somebody? Do you appreciate people? Do you share? I mean, I say share the love. I think it's truly about that. I think if you're if you're kind to others, mm -hmm. as you're talking about in practice, specifically with your patients, it so goes so far. They'll remember that kindness. They'll remember that care and concern you gave them. They'll carry that to their family. Do you know that I saw Justin, uh, Dr. Blake and he was so nice to me and he took such good care of me and he gave me these orthotics and then he followed up with me two weeks later and made sure that I was okay and asked about my kid and and and, and how he was doing in school. And I'm, I'm not talking about just that sort of uh, uh, yeah, because you know, I've off the cuff with my children to the family physician and literally it's like uh what a question and then the guy's tapping on the you know tapping on the thing another question and then there's no interaction and stuff it's like no. our patients who've been to see colleagues for orthotics tell me about your problem oh you need orthotics here you go that's it i mean it's straight there's no there's no interaction there's no yeah just very robotic yeah very robotic i think it's about authenticity but is I that because then, is it, maybe that's because, uh, I, maybe it's because, well, again, of course, family physicians and through, uh, through the health service state model, we've got 10 minutes. The guys don't have time to draw breath, never mind build, build, a, build a relationship that they may be able to, you know, help. Sure. You can, but I think, I believe you can build kindness instantaneously. You can build a connection with somebody instantaneously. You look them in the eye. You, you, you genuinely show concern in an authentic way. Not in, not in these ways. I mean, I, I meet a lot of people, right? Online, in the world, wherever I go, whatever. Like, you know, if you're authentic, you can tell if someone's real. You could tell if they're speaking from their heart. Whatever that may be, you can see it. And you could see if, it's, if they're not. You could see if they're fake. You could see if they come off, um, you know, better than you or more important than you. You know, we're yeah, all that is, that is more important. I mean, because there there is different. I mean, there's different types of patients. I mean, there's the patient who gets referred to you. Mm -hmm. So there, you're already seen as that fiduciary or the expert because the orthopod or the physical therapist. So the patients are are coming through, especially if you've been on a waiting list. Mm -hmm. The patient's getting there with certain set expectations. And uh, that's completely different from the patient who finds you through your social media or uh, comes to you on a, on a self-referral or a family friend referral. Uh, and, of course, I mean, some people think that family friends referrals are really good. But a lot of times it's like, well, I was able to help them, but you've got a completely different problem than Mary did. I'm not going to help you. So a lot of those sort of so patients come in different ways. That's what I was interested in as we with, over, over the years was they – the interaction with the with the patients who, who say find you from different from from different methods. They're just a completely different patient, and also from the advertising or the way that you uh, we were able to write different advertising copy. Mm -hmm. And again, a lot of the Google stuff that we did was was for our phone today to book an appointment this week, mm -hmm. where a lot of the long term email patients and that we built relationships with through whatever way we contacted them or they found us through social media or newspaper. They were a lot longer standing, more educated patients when they came to us to say we weren't about just fill the slot tomorrow. And I think that's a lot of people when you do do some marketing or advertising or improvements on the on the bit working on the business to to bring in more patients. I think people think it's just going to happen tomorrow. I, I totally agree. I think I've seen it. Uh, we we consult with offices. We consult with clinicians. You know, they, you, I mean, I had that paid, quite, I had that conversation a couple of weeks ago. We're, we're in two months into this, and I'm not seeing the results. Yeah, 
I mean, again, the short view, short view, long view, right? I think when you think about building a brand, building a practice, building, you know, yourself as, as a KOL, right? Putting yourself in the media, putting yourself in PR articles, you know, it, it's a long view. This is a three, five year plan. Yep. This is not a three month, six month plan. And you yeah. every those diabetic talks that I've, you know, that I did 15 years ago on a cold, wet January night. You know, those brought in a lot of patients over the years, but they didn't fill the appointment book the next week. Exactly. It's consistent. But over 15 years, they brought in a lot of. They lot did. Of and I think you touch on the point, consistency, right? It's uh, So the two two things that I think are so important and I think is is I don't really hear about it a lot is authenticity and consistency. Be who you are, be true to yourself, and be consistent with the way you do your business. Mm -hmm. So treat everybody with dignity and respect, right? And consistently show up. Consistently, you know, and and provide a um, or build rather a, a, a reproducible and consistent program that you know is going to produce results. Yeah, and, and that's going to involve everybody else in the team. But I mean, I got to the stage where, I would, and that's again, the people who work for with me. We want to, I mean, I want a business that runs without me. Yes. And a lot, a lot of people, a lot of practices have jobs. It wouldn't mm -hmm. work if they didn't show up on the Monday. Mm -hmm. You know, if they weren't there to turn on the lights and do all the day-to-day -day stuff. And, you know, the, uh, you know, I, I wanted, if I got to the stage, luckily we were able to have, we had systems, well, that took systems, that took organization over years mm -hmm. that the practice was able to run without me. That's right. So it was actually it was an actual business rather than a job. Yeah, yeah, and that so, important. so important. That's a that's a great point. But you have to have those relationships with the people that are on your team. They have mm -hmm. to feel a part of your mission, a part of your goals. They have to be willing to be supportive in what you where you see it going, and they have to speak the same language. Right? We have to speak the same language. We have yeah. to communicate. They have to feel appreciated, acknowledged, a part of. We can't be this. Oh, Doc, Dr. Jones is in here, and you know, and 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 have this sort of hierarchy, if you will. It, it's like we're all together in this. The success of this practice hinges on everyone's involvement. Everybody's important, and everyone has to. What do we want more than anything? We want to feel important. We want to feel appreciated. Everybody, every human being wants that. So if we have the ability to do that, not only in our practices, but in our daily life, it'll translate for years and decades, decades. You'll, you'll be, and you'll be able to step away from your practice and know that your patients are being treated as if it was you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, yeah, little, uh, yes, yeah, so that's where, that's where sort of you know, scripting comes in and all those sort of things. As you say, everybody's singing from the same sheet. Yeah, because patients are sneaky like that. They'll ask you a question, they'll ask me a question, and they'll compare answers. They want the same mm -hmm. answer because sure, sure. things are consistent. And so, so the uh, so you mentioned the lower extremities. Sorry, the, the, the sort of you got you have the mastermind groups, but there was the expert group, and then there was the diabetes group, and and, and those are available through. Although that's that's part of the mastermind, is it? So, so we the way our brands are set up right now, we have LER Magazine, which yep. is the publication. We have LER Expert, which it's is the issue. Although I, well, I read the first opening chapter, it's like well, there's so much turnover and so many people go skiing. I mean, are there are the ski resorts all open? I mean, you guys seem to be. A ski resorts are open up here. Yep, ski resorts are open. You know, it's Europe, Europe's still closed. They are. Yeah, your Europe's still closed. Uh, I think they were talking about fifth of March, but they pushed it back a little bit. Okay. I don't, uh, the ski season's not going to happen. No. No. Uh, yeah. All the skiing's are not going to happen. But yeah, I hope to go to skiing this or do do a few weeks sort of treatment this year, mm -hmm. patients. But but anyway, but yeah, you know, this thing it was like it was a multi million pound business. Yeah, that didn't happen here this year or right. in Europe. You know, where we were delayed too. Um, but you know, they're open and limited. Um, you know, uh, social distancing. You know, COVID yeah. restrictions and so forth. Some of the uh, you know the restaurants are, are not open. Um, you know, from fifty percent capacity in some. So yeah, yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a new reality, like online life. 
It's so true. So true. Um, so you know, so we, so we had the great articles there. So I, I cut you off. So okay, you know, so we're about the extremity review. Yeah, yeah. Low extremity review. We have LER magazine. That's lermagazine.com. All our archives, all our issues, all our content is there. We have um, LER expert, which is our consulting um, arm where we go into practices and, and we help uh, clinicians develop content, build social media presence and, and, and SEO. We do websites. We've, we've done a host of that. We're in the same game. We are. We are. Well, this is collaboration. I mean, this is what it's all about. And then um, and then we and then we have LER Expo, which is our online event company uh, where we host. Um, we mod I moderate uh, and present. Yeah. There was a great, I mean, the the, the, the the foot and ankle show in the UK run by Tony Gavin was a great event, and that ran uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And it's similar; it's all online based uh, now. And I mean, that's going to be the that's that's the future. Yeah, there's no question. Then I have uh, um, uh, another publication geared towards the parents of youth athletes called MVP Parent, MVP Parent Magazine. Many people don't know about it. It's in its early infancy stages of a launch. Uh, we do have a website, it's MVPParent.com. Great content, working closely with the NATA nutrition experts. It's educating the parents of youth athletes on performance, on um, training, um, nutrition, sleep, um, keeping pe keeping athletes in the game, keeping youth athletes in the game. Um, and uh, so there's just a you know a wealth of products, a wealth of opportunities uh, that we offer. A lot of crossover. You know, I really I really think um, in terms well, of you talk about, you talk about the athletes. I mean, if you've got, I mean, you know, anybody in a college sort of set up, I mean, they've got the, they've got the trainers, the orthopedists, the, 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 uh, the rehab therapists, the, the coaches, the psychologists, the dietitians, that everything's feeding in to make this guy the better athlete. That's right. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, a lot of times I think that as clinicians, we don't do this. So you've got, you know, maybe you're a little bit stressed and you're you're not sleeping right and, and and different things you're not getting the right coaching and the right sort of sounding board and to help to sort of keep you keep you moving and tracking in the right direction so you can perform better that's what it's all about and and you know it, it all translate right i mean that happens to be for youth athletes but the the podiatrist or the physical therapist is picard i mean we're all trying to do the same thing for our patients Get them performing at the highest level. Get them functioning at the highest level. So you know, collaboration is really where you see it. Uh, that's. I mean, I I believe success comes through collaboration. Um, I think, you know, listening. You know, I heard a term a long time ago. You know, take the cotton out of your ears and put it in your mouth. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it. Step back, listen, and you can learn. Learn to listen and listen to learn. Right. I mean, it, it's just true. I I. I I don't know. It, it's worked for me in my career. Yeah. I, 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 enjoy, I appreciate people. I genuinely appreciate the relationships that I've been able to develop over the years. Mm -hmm. Good ones and some not so good ones. You learn from the ones that are not so good. You learn about yourself in those situations. Yeah. It's all, uh, it's all learning. <laughs> it's all learning. And, uh, and, and what was I going to say? Yeah. Because it's uh yeah, so it's right across, and then the, uh, and the and there's a diabetic module as well. There's the diabetes. So we don't have a diabetes module, but what we do is we so um, the PF. You, were about you wanted to do more training. Yeah. So the the Podorthic Footwear Association. Right. Um, they have brought me on the LER team on to develop all of their you know to do marketing and to do their sales efforts and to do their strategy. And so we are developing a quarterly event series for them. Uh, the next one is going to be in April. It's going to yeah. be on diabetes. Um, and then actually we're, we're having a one hour, one and a half hour one in March, a diabetic one as well uh, in March on um, the, I think it's on the diabetic. Um, well, I'm not going to look it up right now while we're on this call, but it, uh, it's on the diabetic foot. Um, but there's, you know, there's a tremendous amount of, uh, of, of content there. Um, the cool thing about the expo. Well, of course, the great thing is about the expo is you get the world expert in whatever field coming on that you'd never get to see or ever get to, you know, you read his research papers, yeah. or, you know, read, read something. You're never going to get to see him live or, or normally. 
true. Or just to see what he's working on today. And I mean, that's where the live events are the really. Oh, we only do live events. Um, every event we do is recorded. But yeah. like you, I think for me, my belief is, you know, these in these events that we're doing, um, the LER Expo events, it's all about engagement. If you have engagement, you have an event. If you have no engagement and I'm sitting back here and I'm like this, I'm not engaged mm -hmm. and I'm not in the screen. I'm not a part of, you don't have a successful event. Yeah. So we've, we've developed, I believe a very good recipe for building these events, for marketing these events and for creating successful interactions. You know, our interactions are high. When you have an event that goes an hour and, and a half and it ends up going almost two hours, because the community is 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 a part of the event and they're on stage asking questions and engaged. Yeah. And do you have sort of do you have breakout sections from there? Because there was a really good web summit online, and uh, I think it was November, end of November, December. Anyway, it was it uh, run by an Irish guy, but it's an international web summit. But they had breakout rooms where you just hit a button and you just get a random person. We have that. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's really good. Yeah, so we call that speed. We we call that speed dating. Yeah, speed dating all thing. Yeah, it was great. No, we it's a cocktail party. So again, you know, to me, this this world we're in right now, because we have the first person contact, it's important to build the events and have events that are as close to being in person as possible. So creating these cocktail hours where you can one-on-one -on -one with somebody for five minutes or less, yeah. creating little little discussions where we could throw a topic out and then eight people could be around a table just meeting each other and and and, and dialoguing. You know, those kinds of interactions are what take place at live and in-person events. So because well, I mean, that's, of, where, that, that's where I've dipped in and out of you. You've been on the clubhouse yet? Yes. It, yeah, I mean, it, some of it's a bit rubbish, but. Maybe yeah. I'm living in the wrong rooms, but that's it. It's a collaboration. It's people who sit around talk, talk, talking. You're, you're gonna, you know, it, it's, it's a, uh, yeah. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, it is, and I think you know, I think again, it comes down to just being who you are, allowing your personality to come out, and just networking and interacting with people, and genuinely just dialoguing like we have. We had no set script today. We had no set agenda. We just got in the room and started talking about all kinds of different things, and yeah. I. Think you know, that's one more. I've probably got a couple more questions. You should write this stuff down as we come in because I thought about this five minutes ago. <laughs> so, I'm not hammering on to, 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 to uh, about the surgery and the, and the biomechanics, but I am. <laughs> but the, uh, do you think, well, it, it's it's obviously a quicker route to surgery for, for, for the, through, through the podiatry sort of residency and things. And because there's more swing to sort of surgery and, and, the, and the biomechanics is sort of being left. Uh, you can see it. Will, will, will it just be doing sort of pure surgery? Will podiatrists just be doing yeah. surgery and nothing else? Um, I don't know. I mean, that's a tough one. That's really a tough one. Um, I, I really, I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, that's a, it's a tough one. I think. Yeah. But, but, but obviously, that this is driven by the demand through for the students at the school then. Mm hmm. It isn't just somebody in Temple or, or New York College or, or California just saying, I can't play a while they're teaching biomechanics. I don't understand it. Let's just teach surgery. Mm -hmm. I mean, there must be, there must well, they be. Are. Yeah, they are just teaching surgery. So it's, yeah. you know, it's a tough, it, 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 it's unfortunate that the biomechanics isn't part of and should be, but there's going to be other, I think there'll be other schools and other things opening up that'll teach more, more by bi teach biomechanics. Mm -hmm. Um, Justin, I have to pick up my daughter. At so you got it's my kids haven't gone back to school since before Christmas. I mean, I, yeah, I got to grab her at uh, at twelve, yeah. and I got at least twenty minutes to get there. So I'm. Okay. I thought we were going to be down there. Kids, and uh, we will uh, we'll we'll talk to David uh, soon. And it works for Adidas. Thank you very much, Rich. Uh, Lower Extremity yeah. Review. Uh, you can find him there. Uh, my name's Justin Blake from Justin Blake Media. Uh, we will uh, we will talk again soon. Looking forward to it, man. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Take care, buddy. And we will. Uh, that's Instagram gone. We'll see you later, everybody.